Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out today. We've got quite a plethora of people in here. A lot of people look like they were forced to be here. Attendance. Anyway, uh, before we get things rolling, I'd like to start by thanking the people that made this possible, our sponsors. First of all, the Institute of Leadership and Entrepreneurship. Our webcasting partner for today is Peach New Media. And our media partner is WABE 90.1 FM. Uh, it wouldn't be possible without these guys, so we really appreciate them. Um, today, we have a very special speaker, our very own Bud Peterson. Uh, Mr. Peterson was appointed president in February of '09. He's our 11th president in tech history. President Peterson hasn't always been a president, though. He, he started somewhere. He was actually a wide receiver and a tight end at Kansas State. Um, at, at Kansas State, he also got his master's in mechanical engineering. After getting his master's there, he went to Texas A&M and got his doctorate in mechanical engineering. With his doctorate, he went to NASA, and at NASA, he developed a technique to determine priming capability with high heat pipes and low gravity. Before coming to Tech, President Peterson was the chancellor at the University of Colorado Boulder. Here at Tech, President Peterson's made it a point to get out and meet everyone, meet students. He's known for showing up at venues around campus, getting his face with the name, really involved with all the students here at Tech. So we're lucky to have him in our venue today to hear what he's got to say. So without further ado, let's please give a warm welcome to our president, Bud Peterson. Thanks, JP. Thank you very much. I think I'm live here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the introduction. I want to also introduce my wife, Val Peterson, who's here. Um, so if I get a little nervous, please forgive me. Um, you know, it's interesting to be invited to a venue like this to be asked to talk about leadership. I think it's actually a little presumptuous to perhaps talk about leadership, especially somebody that's got a degree in mathematics and three degrees in engineering. But what uh, I'd probably be more comfortable talking about thermodynamics, but that, about half of you probably wouldn't find that near as interesting. But what I'd like to do today is to talk about leadership a little bit and some of my perspectives on leadership, but to do it in a way that kind of contrasts what leadership is and, in my opinion, what it's not. And the way I hope to do that is to really to try to draw some comparisons or parallels between what leadership is and how you provide it, but to do that in a way uh, where I talk about the difference between management and leadership, because I think there is a big difference. We often talk about managers and we talk about leaders, and if you're very, very fortunate, you can find somebody that's a good manager and also a good leader. Um, it's easier, actually, to find a good manager to help a good leader than it is to have a good leader help a good manager. But if you think about those two terms and you think about management, talking about managers and talking about leaders, when we think about a lot of expressions, this is actually something that's been published in the Wall Street Journal, and it talks about this a little bit, that people don't want to be managed, they want to be led. Uh, we don't talk about world managers or educational managers or political managers, we talk about political leaders. Um, world leaders, religious leaders, labor leaders, business leaders. And so there is a difference, and we can learn a lot from that. Uh, I like this quote that was in the Wall Street Journal, that the carrot always wins over the stick. Uh, ask a horse. Um, you can talk about leading a horse to water, but you can't manage him to drink. Uh, and so what I hope to do today is to, to talk a little bit about my perspectives of what leadership is, uh, and then to do that by comparing the difference between what I think management is and is not and what I think leadership is and is not. Um, I hope to leave about 10, uh, at least 10 minutes and maybe 10 or 15 minutes to try and answer some questions at the end. And uh, you can be thinking of those questions about the talk as we go through or about some other questions if you want to ask questions about furloughs or the uh, why we didn't cancel or call the game off Saturday because of the weather 
or those types of things. I'm ha happy to answer those. But we're going to go through these kind of one at a time. And you look at this in just kind of a broad perspective about what is the difference between managers. Managers identify the steps. They run the ship. They avoid mistakes. They're bosses. Uh, they remain businesslike. Uh, they try to be heroes. There's a lot of actions that are in there when you look at what managers do as opposed to leaders and what uh, they do and what types of people they are or what types of characteristics they possess. So what I hope to do is to kind of walk through each of these and then uh, to talk about them in a little more detail. Uh, the first one of these, uh, if you go back and look, leaders, managers identify the steps, leaders articulate the vision. And when I think of the uh, idea of articulating a vision and what that means, uh, I get an immediate response. The thing that comes to my mind, and it may be partially because of the generation uh, that I'm with or from, but it has to do with the vision that John F. Kennedy articulated when he talked about going to the moon. Because when you think about visions that people have that are really visions beyond uh, what one might think possible, this is certainly a representation of that. And in the early 60s, before we had successfully orbited the Earth, before we had successfully orbited the Earth, John Kennedy made a speech. And, and I don't know how many of you know where that speech was, but he announced that we were going to go to the moon. Uh, and he said that, uh, I'll do my New England accent, before the end of the decade, <laughs> we will send a man to the moon and return him safely. Uh, and that was in Rice Stadium in Texas. Uh, it was in Rice Stadium. And what you don't normally hear in that statement is the next line, uh, the next couple of lines. Why do we go to the moon? Why does Rice play Texas? Uh, at that time, Rice University was in the Southwest Conference with the University of Texas. Rice has... 6,000 students. The University of Texas at that time probably had 30,000. And the next statement is very telling. He says, why does Rice play Texas? Not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And that's why we're going to go to the moon. That particular vision was one that motivated the country in a way that's, that few other visions uh, or statements have motivated the country, certainly in my lifetime. Uh, you can think of other times during the history of the United States where the president has made a statement uh, certainly Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt, uh, some of the statements around the major traumatic events that occurred in the country provide opportunities. But the thing I like about Kennedy's statement was it was a vision. And it did basically all of these things. Uh, it encouraged experimentation. It touched people's emotions. Um, and it clearly communicated what we were going to do. Now, there's a great story, if you get on the Internet, um, and it's, uh, if you get on the internet, you can see it. It's called A Message to Garcia. And it talks a little bit about uh, a story where the president calls in this person uh, and during the Cuban Revolution and wants to send a message to Garcia, who was a guerrilla fighter in Cuba at the time. And he calls in uh, this individual and he says, I want you to take a message to Garcia. And the individual doesn't ask, who's Garcia? Where's Garcia? How do I cross a hostile island that's uh, long distance away and try to find Garcia? Just commits to doing it. And that's what John Kennedy did with his announcement that we were going to go to the moon. That it was a very positive statement. It was touched the emotions of the country, generated a tremendous response. He didn't say, well, we're going to orbit the Earth and we're going to do a docking maneuver in low Earth orbit. In fact, what's interesting is uh, we were, Val and I were out at an uh, antique shop and a friend of ours, I saw a National Geographic issue from 1962 that projected how we might go to the moon, and it turned out that it was correct. And uh, he ended up finding one of those on the Internet and sending it to me. But there's not a lot of information in his statement, but it was clearly a vision that people could latch on to. Now, what I didn't like about, or what I don't like about that statement, and one of the dangers, I think, of leadership is that it's easy to rally the troops, to build support for yourself, by creating a common enemy, by having a we-they mentality. And it's not clear, but there is some sense of that in Kennedy's statement that we're going to go to the moon, because part of that, what wasn't said, is we're going to go to the moon and we're going to beat the Russians. Uh, and that's part of what galvanized the community. And as you think about creating visions, I'd, I'd caution you to be careful about creating visions 
that identify a common enemy. Because you can, I, you can think of many, many cases in history uh, where people have been able to generate tremendous public support or uh, just remarkable support from groups of individuals to do some things that are, um, that are fairly unsavory by finding and identifying a common enemy. And that's one caution I'd make that I think um, that, uh, that I, I have a little concern about that statement that Kennedy makes, because what he doesn't say, we're going to go to the moon, we're going to return safely, and we're going to beat the Russians. But that was certainly some of what was behind it. The third point I want to make on this is he, at that point, clearly transformed this vision that he had for what he wanted to accomplish, and it became a, 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 a vision for the country. It went from his vision to our vision very, very quickly and really galvanized the country and moved them forward in a way uh, that, that allowed us to really accomplish something that was actually quite remarkable when you, when you examine it in some detail. Again, at the time he made that statement, we had not successfully orbited the Earth. And if you watch things about the space program, and I've been involved in some research in the space program, the number of boosters that, launched, that were on the launching pad and then exploded before they ever got to... A 1,000 feet is just incredible. Uh, but it was a statement that articulated a vision that people could clearly understand. Um, I, li I like this quote by Al Albert Einstein. To avoid criticism, do nothing, say nothing, and be nothing. One of the things that leaders have to be able to do is to identify a vision and determine what that vision is and to be able to communicate that vision. It's something that we're trying to do collectively through the strategic planning process here at Georgia Tech. We have undertaken a process to try to identify what Georgia Tech should be like, what the educational environment will be like in 20 or 25 years. Really a very, very ambitious goal when you think about it. And for those of you in the room that can, think about what your life was like 20 or 25 years ago. But it's hard for some of you in the room, the students I understand, to understand what the environment was like. But in 1984, I was a new assistant professor at Texas A&M University and raised my hand in a, fac in a faculty meeting and said, I think we ought to get a fax machine. Uh, and the department chair said, what in the world would we do with one of those? Um, and you think about the advances that were made. You can't find a fax machine today um, except in a museum. But you think about the changes that have been made in, this 20, in the past 25 years and try to project ahead. Um, leaders designed the ship as opposed to, uh, trying, to uh, uh, trying to build the ship. It's a, not a situation where you can do everything that you need to do that's possible. Oftentimes, one of the, I, I think one of the traps that I find myself falling into, and I have to back off, but one of the traps I find myself in is trying to do too much, uh, trying to do everything, because I think I can do everything. Um, what you need to do is evaluate what it is that you can do that nobody else can do, uh, and focus on those types of things. And you've all seen, I'm sure, this two-by-two two matrix of urgent and uh, not urgent and important and not, uh, not important, but to focus on the things that are urgent and important first, but then to also focus on the things that you can do that no one else can do, uh, and to try to make sure that that's where you focus your time. So it's a systemic view rather than reductionist, so it's try to think about the big picture. One of the things I like to do with the senior leadership team here uh, at Georgia Tech and at Colorado and when I've worked with groups when I was uh, uh, in the dean's office at Texas A&M was to bring together the department chairs there or the cabinet here, the senior leadership team, and have a conversation for two hours about issues, none of which we can solve in the next six months. So it's off limits. It's against the rules to talk about anything or any issues that we think we can solve in the next six months, but per, to project out ahead of that and to try to think of this, syst this systemic view as opposed to re reductionist view. To design processes, policies, and strategies that dissolve problems. Now, there's a great quote. Um, when I left Texas A&M, they gave me a book that I uh, still have, and it's called, uh, it's a book of quotes from the Old West. I was leaving College Station, Texas, and moving to New York. Uh, so they give me a quote of uh, words of wisdom from the Old West. The title of it is, Don't Squat With Your Spurs On. Um, words of wisdom from the Old West. And there's a saying in there, a quote that says, um, good judgment comes from experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. 
Um, and if you think about that a little bit, we have problems that we all encounter. We have problems and issues that happen every day. I mentioned the weather on Saturday. Uh, you, if you were at the football game, uh, you saw that it started raining late, late in the fourth quarter. We have a protocol for making decisions about how to deal with the uh, lightning, tornadoes, high winds, or uh, uh, yeah, lightning strikes, high winds, or tornadoes in the football stadium. It's a pretty clear protocol. At 15 miles, they gather the senior leadership team in the operations booth. At 10 miles, we make some announcements, and you probably heard those announcements three times. Uh, we went through that process, and it was, we were very close to, uh, closing, to stopping the game, uh, evacuating the stadium, and when you start that process, you can't start it back up. You can't start the game for 30 minutes. We were three minutes to go in the game and very close to canceling, uh, to, to stopping the game, postponing it, and uh, evacuating the stadium. And today, we met with that same group of five people that come together with, uh, when it gets within 15 miles and said, what did we do right, what did we do wrong, and what can we do better next time? I gave us about an 8.5 uh, on a 10-point scale in terms of how we handled that particular situation. But we were within one lightning strike of evacuating the stadium. But this idea of what can we do so that these problems and the issues that we encountered there don't appear or occur again. It's less about trying to find out who's responsible for issues or, or things that happen than it is about understanding how to prevent them from happening again. I talk a lot about uh, being into no-fault uh, management. Some of you uh, may rec remember the no-fault insurance and all the issues surrounding no-fault management. I'm less concerned about whose fault it is than how we keep things from happening again. Do we have the policies, the procedures, the strategies we need uh, in place to try to dissolve those problems? And then to try to incorporate learning processes to empower people. Um, I learned long ago that while I may want to do everything myself, and I have a certain way that I might want to do those things, um, the chances are if I will empower people to do those, the end product will be better. First of all, they're probably smarter than I am. Second of all, they're probably more invested than I am. And third, they probably know more about the issues than I do. Um, and I think about my own personal experience where I've had someone that said, well, I want you to go out and I want you to do this. And, and in order to do it, I want you to do this and this and this and this. And in the back of my mind, try as I might to avoid it, I'm saying, you know what? If you really know how to do all this yourself, why don't you do it yourself? Uh, but to empower people to get out and to do things and to be creative, uh, very, very important. Um, this is a little bit uh, a cartoon. I don't know if you can read it in the back, but it says there's all these linebackers and defensive lineman on the right side of the, or the left side of the boat, and that's me on the right side there and my colleagues. Um, I've got it too, Leaf, a strange feeling. We've been going in circles. But to empower people to understand the situation and how to make changes necessary to solve problems that come up and to try to put the policies and practices in place that prevent those issues from arising again downstream. Um, leaders encourage experimentation. They support and drive new things. Um, the, uh, if we go back to the first slide, and we look at that comparison, and I'll try not to do this too much, but uh, uh, I think managers try to avoid mistakes. They want to avoid mistakes at all costs, because those mistakes may reflect badly on them. But leaders, I think, encourage experimentation, and understand the importance, I'm going the wrong way, understand the importance of uh, experimentation, and the role that it might play in improving processes. I think good leaders are curious. They're naturally curious. They like to encourage curiosity among their particular, uh, the people that they work with. I think back to a situation where I was a young assistant professor. I shared a laboratory with another faculty member. We were doing work in heat transfer. And uh, I had told my graduate students that they could spend up to $250 uh, without talking to me uh, on the research contracts that we had, that if they needed to go out and get some parts or some equipment or some uh, materials, that they could spend up to $250 without talking to me. The colleague that I had at that particular time required his graduate students to come and talk to him about every single expense. 
and they were just literally frozen in place because they couldn't get anything done. We had an interesting conversation after about uh, six or eight months of sharing this laboratory and the way we approached the students in that. And uh, he said, well, I just want to be involved. I want to know what they're doing. I want to know what their plans are. And it's this idea between allowing people to have the freedom to try new things and to go out and uh, attempt new approaches to problems and to think about new ways to try to uh, address some of the issues that are involved. I have found over and over again that if you will do that, that the people that you're working with will come up with much, much better solutions. You stand, uh, some things are going to happen if you do that. First of all, the solution that you get isn't going to necessarily be the solution that you want. Uh, you may also encounter situations where people do things that, they, that you wish they hadn't done. Uh, that maybe they didn't, they went down a path that you didn't think was the right path or explored a, a potential opportunity or approach that you knew wouldn't work. But through those processes and through that experimentation, the end result I think that you'll have will be much, much uh, better and much, much more positive. The last one here, I think this creating structures for learning. And this is really, uh, I'll come back to this in, in the, uh, I think it's the last slide actually, and talk a little bit about this. But all of this issue about supporting uh, people's creativity, allowing them to be curious, allowing them to experiment, allowing them to be independent and to function very independently, shouldn't diminish the importance of best practices, uh, the importance of interacting with colleagues. This isn't going out by yourself uh, to try to invent or reinvent processes on your own solely as an individual. So you can't ignore the system dynamics, the learning that occurs through that system dynamics or through organizational learning, or the processes for new, structure, new structures for communication. And I want to spend a little time on this last one because I think that today we are seeing such a rapid development in the way people communicate and a schism that occurs in our society about the way people communicate that is generational. Uh, in fact, it's partial generational. Uh, there are students today that are freshmen that communicate in a way that's very, very different than the students that graduated two years ago did. Uh, and I come back to this, think about where we're going to be in 20 or 25 years. But this methods of communication and how you can communicate as you try to create new structures for learning, as you reinvent processes, as you try to uh, interact with people, explore new ideas is tremendously important. The, uh, this uh, idea of structures for communication, I'll tell you, just tell you a little story about uh, a, a series of events that occurred when I was at the University of Colorado. It was before the uh, uh, shootings at Virginia Tech. It was the first year I was at Colorado and we had a snowstorm on Wednesday of final exam week. Commencement was Friday. We closed the university but still held final exams. Uh, that sounds a little strange, but we were able to do it. We tried to send a message out to everybody through the web, through, the, uh, through our website, and shut the server down because there were too many addresses, which is sim about the same thing that happened at Virginia Tech. Uh, it shut the server down. And so we knew at that time in December that we needed to develop a, a uh, communication system that was more effective. So we put together... A, uh, task force that looked with, at vendors and talked to different people about emergency communication systems. And we developed an emergency communication system and put it in place. And so when the students came back in the fall, they could start registering, students, faculty, and staff could register for this text messaging system that we had put in place on Wednesday before classes started on Monday. 1,300 people had registered for it by Monday morning. Now there are 30,000 students about 7,500 employees, so maybe 37 or 38,000 people. 1,300 people had registered for that emergency text messaging system. At 9.43 on Monday morning, the first day of class, a uh, uh, gentleman who's now in an institution, mental institution, had a car wreck on the street next to the student union. The police were right behind him, flipped on the lights. He jumped out of the car, came onto campus, and stabbed the first student he found in the neck. Um, we put out a text messaging system and alerted the students. At 11.30, I was on national TV 
telling people that the student was going to be fine, uh, that he was, I talked to him, he was in the hospital, he was going to be okay, his parents were flying in. Um, and what I couldn't believe is that every single student that the newspapers, that the press talked to had received a text message. And, and I'm sitting there on, on CNN being interviewed trying to figure out why it is that every, as they're showing at the prelim before they start to talk to me, all these students are talking, yeah, we got the test, yeah, we got it. It was out 19 minutes after the event, we, and, and it was uh, uh, really quite remarkable. And that afternoon or the next morning, I couldn't, still couldn't figure out why. I talked to my niece, who was a junior in civil engineering, and said, Molly, did you get a text message? Yeah, I got it six or seven times. Now, the faculty and staff were complaining that they didn't know what was going on. And when I talked to Molly, I understood all of a sudden what had happened. The students got, even the few that were signed up, got a text message and hit three buttons or four buttons and sent it to a whole group of people. The faculty and staff got the message. They looked at it, if they could get it at all. They looked at it, walked down the hall and said, hey, did you see this? <laughs> um, and immediately, immediately, I realized that what we needed to do was to get some 20-year-olds on an emergency text messaging uh, system and to try to get them to uh, tell us what the mechanisms and the vehicles that they used to communicate with each other were and then to incorporate those into our emergency communication system instead of us trying to tell them, allow them to tell us. Uh, I talked to the Parents Association this past weekend, um, I think on Friday, and uh, what advice would you give us? And that is forget about calling your students on the phone. Figure out what they use to communicate and learn how to use that, and you'll be much, much more uh, in touch with the students. Uh, I'm a firm believer that you lead by example, uh, that, that the best thing you can do is to try to set an example for what your expectations are for yourself and that other people will see those expectations, the expectations that you have of yourself, and that they will try to uh, emulate those expectations, and that that is much, much more powerful than any statements you can make or any words you can say or any policies that you can issue. Tremendously important. And I know a lot of times people talk about diversity and you say, is this just lip service? Because how can you give a talk on anything without talking about diversity? The best statement I have ever heard on diversity was made by Bill Wolf, who was the Bill Wolf was the president of the National Academy of Engineering. He's currently the past president of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, and he talked about the, the value of diversity and the rationale uh, for diversity. And he said, aside from the moral and ethical obligations that we have to have a diverse workforce or a diverse group in various, uh, various institutions, it just makes good sense. Because without a diverse workforce, you have ideas that are never thought of, designs that are never imagined, and dreams that are never dreamed. Uh, and I equate that back to myself as a mechanical engineer and to some of the situations that I found if, uh, uh, and go back to uh, this idea that if, JT, stand up for a second. If everybody that designed automobiles looked like JT and I, Val would not be able to reach the pedals and she, we wouldn't have power brakes and power steering. Go ahead, thank you. Um, we wouldn't have power brakes or power steering. She wouldn't be able to reach the pedals. So this idea that people come to the work environment or come to their environment with different ideas, different impressions, different perspectives, different life experiences is tremendously valuable. Another example, and I'm sorry to use all these mechanical engineering examples, but it's the life, kind of the life that I've led. One of my former institutions, a design team, a company gave us a the passenger compartment for automobiles uh, and said design the passenger compartment. It was actually for Saturn automobiles. And one of the design teams that uh, developed one of the designs had put a thing on the back of the passenger seat so you could open the back of the passenger seat like a glove box and there was a hook there. And one of the representatives from the automobile company was looking at that and he said, what's this for? And one of the people on the design team said, that's so the ladies can hang their purses back there so that when they, because when they set it on the seat and put on the brakes, it always falls forward and goes all over the floor. I can guarantee you that it wasn't a white male that thought of the idea of putting a, a hook on the back of that passenger seat for ladies' purses. They understand different learning styles. Uh, they know that 
diversity facilitates a better end product because people do bring these different lifestyles and these different experiences and these different perspectives to the, to the particular environment that they're in. And you, uh, a good leader has to consciously consider the learning styles in selecting the teams, in making the presentations, and in conducting meetings. Um, I'm trying to talk. Uh, I, I'm trying to use words. I'm trying to use PowerPoint. I'm trying to... Uh, uh, use different, different techniques to communicate to you because some of you are very visual in the way you learn and some of you are very auditory in the way you learn. So to recognize that they're different styles and to try to use a combination of approaches and a mixture of those approaches in order to make sure that your message is communicated clearly. Leaders touch emotions, and I'll go back a little bit to Kennedy's, uh, to Kennedy's statement certainly touch the emotions of the country. When you think about the uh, orations and the oratory capabilities of some of the previous presidents we have, and I'll try to be apolitical, but in, you think back to the presidents that we've had over the last 30 years, um, a lot of those individuals could touch people's emotions and were able to get people to buy in to their ideas and their thoughts because they reached out and were able to make an emotional connection with people. That connection, that connection which turns out when you do that and you try to touch people's emotions, that connection allows you to communicate in a personal matter, a manner or a personal fashion. It helps to inspire people. And the last thing, and perhaps the most important thing, and it goes back to what I said before a little bit about allowing people the freedom to exercise their own thoughts, their own initiative, and their own ideas is you end up with people that are committed to their work. That it's not my vision, it's not his vision or her vision, it's our vision. Uh, that people become much, much more committed to what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, this is important to me, this idea of servant leadership. And we've had uh, uh, actually uh, Bill, Bill Turner, thank you, uh, Bill Turner has written a number of books on servant leadership. I was down and met with him uh, not long ago, uh, and he talks about servant leadership. But this idea that leaders uh, are servants. The, uh, I often have said when I was a department chair, one of the things that I said was that if I could only do one thing, it would be to hire the very best faculty I could and the very best staff to hire the very best people, because if we had outstanding faculty and staff, then you have a chance to have great teaching programs, great research programs, great service and outreach programs. If you don't have good people, then you don't have a chance. In mathematics, we call that necessary but not sufficient conditions. Um, if the second thing uh, that I would do, if I, if, if I could only do one thing, would be to have employees that were entirely unselfish in the way they imagine their work environment. Uh, if you hire very good, very good people and have people that are unselfish, it can lead to remarkable successes. And an example I'll use is one that some of you here can relate to. We have a biomedical engineering program that 12 years ago did not exist and today is recognized across the nation as one of the top programs certainly in the top three, and in many people's views as one of the top programs. And I think that one of the things that has made that enormously successful is that the people that were involved in that, in the foundation and the, and the formation of that program, set aside any efforts or attempts to try to take credit. Uh, when you talk about how that program was started and who started it and how it was founded and how it grew, you hear very little about this person did this and this person did this. It was really a very, very broad group effort where there weren't people standing up trying to take credit for the advances that were made. And they have been tremendous advances to go from no program to one of the best programs in a very, very competitive field in 10 years is a, a tremendous accomplishment. People that are able to set their egos aside, and I think that's what the biomedical program had, and I've told the people that helped to start that, the people here at, at uh, Georgia Tech, the people at Emory that were involved with that, that I think that's one of the things that made that program so successful. 
I, I have tried to use the term and try to use the term that people don't work for me. They work with me. That it's not this idea that, again, that somehow I'm a boss uh, and people work for me, but people work with me. We all are trying to get the same thing accomplished. We're all trying to make Georgia Tech a better place, to make it a more effective educational institution that does a better job of conducting and promoting outstanding research and helping to enhance the economy of the state of Georgia and the country. Good leaders, I believe, ask, what can I do differently to best serve? How is it that I can best serve? One of the things that we've worked very hard on in the past six months is I've spent a lot of time going around the state. Uh, Val and I have traveled around the state some this summer. Um, I'm trying to think. Today's Wednesday. Monday I was in Macon. Uh, yesterday I was in Hawkinsville talking to Rotary Clubs. Uh, got a lukewarm. How many of you know where Hawkinsville is? Uh, got a, not too many. Uh, it's close to Athens. Uh, so I got a lukewarm reception in Hawkinsville. Um, and on Wednesday, next Wednesday, a week from today, I'll be in Athens uh, talking to the Rotary Club. But to go out around the state to try to talk to people and find out what it is that Georgia Tech can do better to try and better serve the people of the state of Georgia. And to understand that the only part of what I can control at Georgia Tech, no matter how hard I try, the only thing that I can really control is me and how I interact with people and how I respond to people and how I react to the things that are happening around me. Uh, and that's incredibly important, this idea of servant leadership, of working with people and not trying to be the boss, but to set the ego aside and be able to work with people. Great cartoon. If you can't read it, it says, sure glad the hole isn't in our end. Um, <laughs> And that, I think, represents this idea of, of it's not a we-they mentality. It comes back to the statement I made on the first slide about a little bit of the concern about the vision of going to the moon, that we're going to beat the Russians. It's not this we-they mentality. It's that we're all in this together. One of my favorite statements, and I just made it actually yesterday morning, Monday morning at breakfast with the people that I was at breakfast, is Georgia Tech cannot get better at the expense of the other institutions of higher education in the state of Georgia or at the expense of K through 12 education. What we have to do, the discussion was actually about what role should we as an institution, here's a technological institute, what role should we play in K through 12 education? And I had stated that I thought we should play a very active role. We can no longer, higher education can no longer sit and say, you know, if the high schools and elementary schools would just send us students that were better prepared, we could do a better job of educating it. We have got to participate in that. The person I was talking to said, don't let other people dictate what you and your university ought to do. And we had a very interesting discussion. But my comment was, Georgia Tech can't get better at the expense of higher, of uh, K through 12 education. There's uh, a couple of things that I want to close with. And they're really two quotes. Uh, one, I haven't talked at all about the characteristics. I've talked about a contrast between managers, what I think managers are, and what I think leaders should be. I haven't talked a lot about some of the things that you may get in talks on leadership about ethics, about um, trustworthiness, about all of those personal characteristics that are so very, very important to leaders. But I love this quote by Norman Schwarzkopf. I'm actually a Norman Schwarzkopf fan. Uh, he's got a couple that I like, but this is, leadership is a potent combination of strategy and character, but if you have to give up one, give up strategy, because you can't underestimate the value and the importance of the personal characteristics that you as a leader have. Val and I were having a conversation this weekend. We had invited some people, uh, we, as we do at every home game, into the football suite, uh, and there's... 200 people in there. And we kind of have some guidelines that we use uh, in the suite. And somebody had uh, kind of stretched those guidelines a little bit. And, uh, and Val's comment to me was, somebody needs to tell him that everybody's watching and everybody knows, and that when he does that, it reflects on him and his ability to be a leader. Uh, and so I think this is, uh, this is really important. 
The last thing I want to share with you before I flip the slide is to, actually I guess there's two more, is to talk a little bit about some background. When I was, uh, another story, um, when I was this young assistant professor, and I think it was actually in 1984 uh, or 83, 84, that time frame, I had a Chinese graduate student whose name was Xu, uh, uh, XU. Uh, and he had uh, just come over from China. He, uh, I was looking, I was a new assistant professor, found him, he was working with me, and he asked me to come, asked Val and I to come to dinner with he, him at the, uh, to celebrate the Chinese New Year. And we went to the restaurant where this was. We kind of didn't know what to expect, and we were a whole bunch of round tables where the Chinese Student Association was celebrating the Chinese New Year. And we were a little early, and I'm walking around the uh, table looking at the name cards, and who's sitting next to me but this guy named Art Hansen. Uh, now, Art Hansen is a former president of Georgia Tech. I didn't know that at the time. At the time, Art Hansen was head of the Texas A&M University system. So in Texas, there's, uh, it's much like here, there's a president for each institution and a chancellor for the system. Art Hansen was the chancellor. And we had a conversation at that meeting, and I'll read this to you. I know it's a little hard because I think it's important. Art Hansen and I had a, he's a mechanical engineer, and here I am, an assistant professor sitting next to the chancellor for the university, or the Texas A&M University system, and he says, are you going to my speech tomorrow? Um, I didn't even know he was speaking. Uh, I said, of course, uh, of course. And at that, particular, uh, at that particular speech, Art Hansen made a statement. And today, in my desk drawer, I have a copy of that speech and this phrase is cut out, uh, and I put plastic around it. It's kind of, and it's a lot of scotch tape, but it's in my desk drawer, and it says, now this is Art Hansen, who is a former president of Georgia Tech, was at Purdue University, and then chancellor at the Texas a and University system. And he says, one of the traits that characterizes good leaders is competence, and the ability to instill that competence in others. Typically, those who wish to accomplish anything of significance have little have just a little more competence than the facts would justify. It's something that outstanding executives have with common brilliant political leaders and great artists. It's true of societies as well as individuals. Every great civilization has been characterized by competence in itself. Lacking the competence, too many leaders add ingenious new twists to the modern art of which I call how to reach a decision without really deciding. They require that the question be put through a series of clearances within the organization and let the clearance process settle it, or take a public opinion poll and let the poll settle it, or develop elaborate statistical schemes, hoping that out of them will come unassailable evidence for one course of action or another. This is not to say that good leadership cannot profit enormously from good information. If the modern leader doesn't know the facts, they're in grave trouble, but rarely do the facts provide unqualified guidance. After the facts are in, the good leader must in some measure emulate the little girl who, when asked by her teacher what she was drawing, looked up and said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, but Mary, nobody knows what God looks like. Mary responded, they will when I get through. <laughs> if you need two things to be a successful leader, I think that those two things are character and competence. That those two things will help carry you through in the leadership opportunities that you have. Close with a couple of comments. We've started, I talked about this strategic planning process and started to uh, try to identify what Georgia Tech should be like in 20 or 25 years. And one of the questions that I've asked as part of that process is what are the characteristics that have in the past and will continue in the future differentiate the graduates from the Georgia Institute of Technology from the graduates at other institutions around the country or in fact around the world? And I believe that one of those characteristics is leadership. And it will be a key focus of our strategic planning process. Things like innovation, creativity, but certainly leadership will play a key role in where we're going as an institution. And then leave, we leave you with this by Walter Littman. The final test of a leader is to leave behind in others the conviction and the will to carry on. The genius of a good leader is to leave behind a situation which common sense without the grace of genius can deal with successfully. When I became a department chair, a department head in Texas A&M, uh, I asked the dean, how do you evaluate 
the department chairs. How do you really evaluate them? And he said, you know, it's really hard to evaluate department heads or department chairs because the best way to evaluate them is to look at the organization three years or five years after they leave and see how well that organization has, has developed. What processes have you put in place? What people have you hired? What things have you done that can allow that organization to function successfully after you're gone? Because if you have those good processes in place, then the, in, then the, the organization can continue to thrive and can, can continue to, to uh, be successful. So with that, I'll stop and be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll ask that you use the microphones right up here. Uh, other questions? Uh, this is going to be a little long, so, uh, the lead up to the question. Okay. So uh, start off with like the, my favorite quote about le Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Uh, my favorite quote about leadership was uh, I was reading this book by this uh, rabbi. And it says in uh, Hebrew, there is no word for leader. You can only uh, like follow a vision, actually. So my thought was if you want to try and create tech to be a leadership, we need tech students to have a vision for what they're going to do after their job. But unfortunately, though, if you ask like any student really at tech, what are you going to do after you graduate, they will literally quote you the price range for what their degree is worth. They're not going to quote you, oh, I'm going to save the world by inventing a better uh, polycarbonate or something like that. So how are you going to try and change this uh, culture at tech? Well, I'm not sure I agree completely with your question. I think a lot of times the response that you get from students when they ask that type of, uh, when they're asked that type of question, uh, you get a response that's monetary in nature because they don't know what they're going to do. Uh, I will tell you that we had a panel that spoke to uh, the Georgia Tech Advisory Board, which is a group of about 35 leaders from government, community, business, industry. Uh, we had a panel of, uh, 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 Bill, was it four students? I think there were four students on the panel. Uh, and they asked those students what they wanted to do 10 years from now. And I will tell you that uh, I don't think she'd mind me saying that the Alina Siskavages, who's the president of the undergraduate student body, said, I want to be the president or the CEO, I can't remember which, of Grady Medical Center. Uh, and, and I hear that a lot about, from students about what they want to do and what they want to do with their lives. Uh, how we change that, I think some of the response that, that you're talking to and referring to is really the result of some uncertainty. I can tell you that uh, JT mentioned that I played football in college, uh, actually played football at Kansas State, and we played two games at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I can tell you that in 1972 and 74, I was not on the field at Colorado saying, you know, someday I want to be the chancellor up in that box up there. Uh, I don't think college students or, or students have an understanding of what it is they're going to do, and so it's a little bit of, about uncertainty. But thanks for the question. Other questions? There's one back here. Uh, just, have, uh, excuse me, just flag down the mics. Uh, if you have a question, just flag down the folks with the mic. Having arrived here four decades ago under Art Hansen, thank you for remembering him. Um, you recently had your senior leadership team read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. Why that particular book at this particular moment, and what are the main takeaways that you wanted to gather from that reading? Uh, it, it was an interesting process. We were going to initiate this strategic planning, uh, the strategic planning process, and uh, I thought I saw Lena sitting in the audience. <laughs> um, uh, we we're going to initiate the strategic planning process, and what I was trying to do was to figure out how we could get people to think creatively, not to think five years or seven years, but to think uh, 25 years out. And I had, uh, we actually, at one point, the, uh, I had talked to uh, Steve Cross, Bill Rouse. Steve Cross is the vice president for GTRI, the Georgia Tech Research Institute. Bill Rouse is a uh, faculty member uh, in ISYE and director of the Tenenbaum Institute. And uh, Chet Warinsky, who's the director for the Office of Organizational Development, I asked those three to kind of lead the strategic planning effort. And we talked about how we could get people to think broadly. 
And, and what about having them read a book? And the first book we came up with was actually uh, Outcast United, which is the book that we required every freshman to read before they came to campus this year. Some of you may have seen Warren St. John speak last Thursday or Friday. That just didn't seem right, quite right. It had some very positive messages that I think are very beneficial to the campus community, but what we were trying to do was find something that would uh, cause people to think creatively. That is a real issue for us in that process. Um, and somebody suggested outliers, and, and, and quite honestly, I can't remember who it was. I think it was one of those three individuals suggested outliers. Malcolm Gladwell, Gladwell the author, also wrote uh, The Tipping Point and Blink. Uh, and I had read The Tipping Point a number of years ago and was quite enamored with some of the statements they made in there. And so I got outliers, read it, and said, this, is, this seems like the right book because it, it, it communicates some messages. And the messages that it communicates, if you haven't read it, it's a quick read. It's really, that had to be, that was one of the criteria too, that we only had, I think I only gave them about three weeks uh, before we were gonna have this retreat, and I was gonna assign them a reading assignment. So it's a quick read, but it has several messages. And one is, there's a certain level of competence that you have to reach to be successful. And once you reach that level of competence, there are a lot of other factors that may enter into it. And it's not to say that hard work isn't important or that uh, uh, intelligence isn't important, but just, and, and I will tell you, when I was in college, I wouldn't have believed this, uh, but I believe it today, that there are a lot of things that happen that position you to be successful. And, and uh, I tell people all the time that uh, the three things that I think you have to do to be successful in these types of jobs is one, hire the very, very best people you can and give them the freedom to do their job. Two, know as much as you can about uh, everything that's possible about the organization. And three, you have to be a little lucky. When we had that young man in Boulder uh, get stabbed, we were a little lucky, a half an inch one way or the other. And instead of being on the news at 11 o'clock, uh, saying he was gonna be fine, I'd have been saying he was, uh, the funeral services will be Wednesday. But this book talks about circumstances and how that can impact it, but how you prepare to take advantage of those circumstances. It talks about a couple of examples, Bill, uh, Bill Gates and his particular situation where he was uniquely positioned to have access, unlimited access to computer programming when he was in seventh grade, uh, which allowed him to do some things that perhaps other people couldn't do. The Beatles, everybody talks about the Beatles being an overnight success. Uh, when they came on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1964, they had played together for seven years before that for hours and hours in Hamburg, Germany as a group. And, and, he, and one of the things is this 10,000 hour rule, which is kind of interesting. That's kind of what convinced me to use this book, that to really succeed at something, you have to spend about 10,000 hours. And if you think about how much time you're gonna spend while you're here as undergraduate students, and I know there's a lot of graduate students here, if you think that eight hours a day Five days a week, 52 weeks a year is about 2,000 hours. Um, then you do that for four, four and a half years, what do you get? You get close to 10,000 hours. So it's a great read. I'd encourage you to do it. Um, I haven't read Blink, but hope to do that soon. Uh, here's one here and then down here. Sir, good to see you. You know, I was all set to be, like, typically confrontational and weird. And then you mentioned that you made your... Uh, your your senior leadership team read Outliers. It's a great book. Oh, um, thanks. Well, you can still so be confrontational. I don't know about <laughs> weird. <but laughs> um, we're talking about leadership here. I'm curious, and, and I don't mean this to be confrontational, but, I'm, but I think it will reveal your character as, in terms of how, how you've progressed as a, as a leader in an academic setting. Can you talk to us about the Ward Churchill stuff at, at the... At, at Boulder and how you, what basically what you learned through that whole sort of craziness? Uh, the question is about Ward Churchill. Um, Ward Churchill is a faculty member at the University of Colorado at Boulder who was, uh, uh, the progression of, of uh, circumstances was that he was invited to speak at Hamilton College in New York, which I think is in Clinton. Uh, in Hamilton College, and then uh, it became clear, this is, uh, I think, in 2004, uh, it's after 9-11, but uh, he made, uh, it became apparent 
when he was invited to speak, some people went back and looked at some of, of his writings, and, and he had some, some speeches that he gave and some writings that he produced that were uh, where he referred to the people that were killed in the 9-11, uh, the 9/11 event as little Eichmanns. Uh, and as a result of that, there are multiple stories about what happened, but ultimately he was terminated from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Now, I arrived, I was appointed as chancellor at the University of Colorado at Boulder about two weeks after the decision to terminate him was made. Uh, but then he appealed it through the faculty senate and that whole process in the regents, and I was there during that period of time. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about it sometime. What I learned, I think what I'd like to do is to go back to a, a situation where I was a department chair and I terminated a faculty member, the highest paid tenured faculty member at Texas A&M. Uh, and the, uh, uh, I, I, I think I learned a lot about how to deal with very, very difficult and stressful situations. Um, I learned at that particular time, uh, I actually was asked at one point in a job interview, tell something that you did well and something that you didn't do so well. And I use that as an example because it is tremendously divisive for an organization when you have that type of situation. Uh, what happened at Texas A&M, and it's still early in the Churchill thing, uh, but what happened at Texas A&M is the faculty senate actually introduced a motion for a vote of no confidence in me and my role uh, there. Uh, they, 18 months later, voted unanimously in support of the decision. Uh, the faculty member was sentenced to three years in jail, uh, and that helped turn the tide a little bit. But I think how you communicate the circumstances surrounding particular events and issues is tremendously, tremendously important, and the importance of communicating that. I won't get into whether the university, one, one side of that issue is did the university fire Ward Churchill because he spoke out, or did they actually fire him because his outspoken statements caused people to look much more closely at his body of work, and there was some clear evidence in my mind of plagiarism and falsification that occurred, and that was the basis for his termination. Uh, Thank you, sir. Um, you have a path, and I was curious. And a long future, oh. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was curious, what do you find that Georgia Tech does, either um, academically or through its culture, that you haven't found at other colleges that you've worked at? What do I find that Georgia Tech does? Um, I'm not sure if it's so much what Georgia Tech does, if it, is, if it has more to do with the students that come here. Uh, the students that attend Georgia Tech, the, and, and I've encountered a lot of them, are tremendously focused. Uh, I've told this story before that people say, what surprised you about Georgia Tech when you came? And, and I again go back to the, some of the student leadership. Uh, Nick Wellcamp was the student body president. Nick's heard me say the, say the story, and I don't mind using his name. I don't think he minds too much. Nick was this, uh, the student body president. He called me, contacted me when I was in Colorado and said, Dr. Peterson, the students have some issues that we'd like to talk to you about. And I said, Nick, you know, write a white paper and send me the white paper. But remember, there are lots of people that will bring me problems. What I like is for people that bring me potential solutions. About the set, so they sent the white paper. And about the second week I was here, I pulled together a group of people. Uh, uh, Vice President Schaefer was among that group. Uh, uh, Vice uh, Provost uh, Smith, a number of folks that interacted with students and to listen to what the students said. And I was so tremendously impressed with the way those students presented themselves. The men had coats and ties on. The women were dressed up. They had a PowerPoint presentation. They had an agenda, an itinerary. Each student had one issue. They went through it. They said, this is what you're doing well. This is what you need to do better. And every single student group that I met with, uh, that I have met with, was exactly the same. That situation replicated and emulated itself. The professional nature and the maturity of the students that we have here is, uh, is something that has, uh, I have to say, has surprised me. The uh, ANAC Society, the Greek Letters uh, Association, the, uh, 
the uh, African American Student Union, every group that I met with, the students came in, they were very, very well prepared, they knew exactly what they wanted to say, and they said it in a very uh, forceful and clear and concise fashion. Uh, and, and I found that to be very impressive. I can only hope that we as an institution are helping students to develop those characteristic and traits as they move through the educational process. One so, last question or two. One. one, one it's a, there's one there, and then we'll take this, and then we'll, okay. uh, we'll close. We have a reception Great. today uh, following the talk. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, with the... Uh, with the, uh, the recent decline in uh, donations from alumni, um, especially those in the Greek community, what is going to be your long-term strategy to remedy that situation? The decline in, in donations, the philanthropic? Yes, uh, towards the... Uh, we are still doing school. reasonably well. It's not great out there. It's a little tough, but we're still doing reasonably well. I, again, some of the things that surprised me are the level of support. You may not realize this, but Georgia Tech is number one in terms of the percentage of alumni that give back to their institution among public universities. Uh, that is really special. That is really special. Uh, I think I don't have any kind of, you know, really marvelous strategy that's outlined. Uh, it really is focused to some extent on these things. What we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do, is get out across the state and to communicate what Georgia Tech is doing to try to help the state of Georgia, what Georgia Tech brings to the state, why people in the state should support it um, from a state perspective, from a private philanthropic or, or philanthropic foundation perspective, is to communicate things like the Tech Promise Program, uh, opportunities that Georgia Tech presents to students in terms of their future. Because people, I think people support philanthropically, uh, there's two things that are kind of fundamental requirements for people to support things philanthropically. They support things that they, number one, feel passionately about, and number two, feel are well-managed. And I want them to think that Georgia Tech is well-managed, and I want to be able to give people something that they can feel passionately about. Uh, just the Tech Promise, you may or may not be aware of it. Tech Promise is a program that Wayne Clough started. It's actually the G. Wayne Clough Tech Promise program. Uh, you're all familiar, I think, with the HOPE Scholarship Program, but the Tech Promise Program guarantees that any student that can get into Georgia Tech whose family income is 150% or less of the federal poverty level, that's about $33,000 a year, that they can come to Georgia Tech for free. That's books, fees, tuition, room, and board. There are 225 students that are part of that program here today. Their average family income is $24,000. These are students that would never be able to attend a university like Georgia Tech. Yet they're going to come here, they're going to graduate, they're succeeding at a rate that's at or better than the average student on the campus. And when they graduate, they'll make twice what their family income is today. And if you can talk about those types of programs, the speakers programs that the College of, of Management has, the uh, scholarship opportunities, what uh, benefits endowed chairs bring to the university and the opportunities that, that present to faculty to explore new areas and do idea-driven research, but to try to talk about the things that we're doing and the things that those philanthropic dollars allow us to do that we could not otherwise do. That Tech Promise program, our goal is to support that through a $50 million endowment. We have to raise $24 million to date and uh, have 225 students in the program. There have been 332 students uh, total that have been in it, so we started some that were juniors and seniors. Uh, but that building that emotion and that passion for what we're doing into people, uh, into their thoughts, and really fundraising is not about asking people for money. It's about convincing people that they should invest in this institution and the young people at this institution. And I have to tell you that that is not a, not a terribly difficult job. Last question. President Peterson, I am an alum, undergraduate and graduate of the School of Management. So thank you for coming and speaking. Go Jackets. Also, uh, I saw the picture of you helping the students move in. Uh, it was great to see you actively participating and helping them bring the boxes in uh, as our president. Question, what are you doing to learn about the tech students that we don't know about? Are you visiting the dorms? Are you talking to them at night? And what do you do as well to, to unwind? How do you recharge your vision uh, right now? Because it's a very hectic time for you still 
uh, learning and getting your feet wet. What are you doing to help recharge your batteries right now during these times and to spend time with your lovely bride? Oh, <laughs> that's a lot. I thought we said one more question. <laughs> that's a lot. Well, first of all, thanks for the comp. <laughs> Thanks for the compliment on the, but they probably got the only picture of me carrying a box. Uh, I mean, they could have followed me all day. I didn't really help that many students moved in. It was, it was more about getting out and talking to the parents during the move-in, uh, the move-in experience than, than about actually physically helping people move in. But we, we did that. It's a lot of fun to get out. I uh, actually graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering. Val and I were working in Kansas City and then quit graduate school or uh, quit working at Black and Beach Consulting Engineers. I took a job as an engineer in Kansas City. Quit working at Black and Beach because I wanted to go back and teach because I enjoyed, really enjoyed working with young people. And uh, the opportunity to interact with students is something that, uh, I mean, this is, pr this is clearly going to be the best part of my week. Uh, trust me. But what am I doing? I think just trying to meet with student groups. Uh, Val and I actually, when we leave here, uh, we'll go to the reception for a little bit, and then we're going to a fraternity uh, to visit with a fraternity. It'll be the first fraternity we visited with as a separate unit during the uh, Rush week. We went on a tour of the fraternity so we could learn more about Rush and what it's like. But I think it, is, uh, it comes back to this, trying to learn as much as you possibly can about every aspect of the university. Um, I uh, have the pleasure of interacting with a number of students. I met with the graduate student president, and uh, one of the other officers earlier this afternoon. So I think it's a question of just trying to interact with students every chance you get in terms of uh, recharging my battery. Um, <laughs> we uh, uh, take walks and talk with my wife. That's probably the best recharging thing that I can do is we take walks and Val will say, let's go for a talk, which means let's go for a walk or let's go for a walk. Uh, and we try to talk. And it's, uh, it's not easy to be enthusiastic about what's going on at this, this institution. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, and good luck. <laughs>